Good morning. Let us, let us begin by settling into the service by listening to our gathering music, which Annette Gurney Hull will provide for us. Thank you, Annette. Some may find it surprising that we had Chinese music this morning when we're going to be listening to the words of the Dalai Lama. But the people of any country are never the people who are the ones who create the problems for the spiritual teachers. So we're happy to have the music of the Chinese people this morning to accompany us. I want to welcome you to the Humboldt Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Whether you're at home on Zoom or here in the sanctuary, whether you're new faces or people who have been here for many years, I want you to know how glad we all are to be together on this beautiful rainy day. Our fellowship, as many of you know, stands on the ancestral land of the Weod people who did not cede their lands. But it is our intention to not only steward these lands well, but to learn how to share in creating equity for the Weyot people who still live here. My name is Bonnie McGregor, and together with Ann Kilby, um, we will be your worship leaders this morning, and uh, ably aided by our technical capacitator, <laughs> Scarlett Tripsmith, and our wonderful pianist, Annette Gurney Hall, our choir leader, Elizabeth Harrington, and our choir. And we hope that all together, we will provide what you came here for and that you will leave with more joy. So we welcome you and we will now enter sacred space by listening to the sound of the bell. Each Sunday, we light a chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And this morning, though we'll be spending much of our time with Tibetan and African Christian wisdom, I've turned to the Celtic poet, John O'Donohue for a chalice lighting blessing to begin the service. A blessing for equilibrium. 
like the joy of the sea coming to the shore. May the music of laughter break through your soul. As the wind wants to make everything dance, may your gravity be lightened by grace. Like the freedom of the monastery bell, may clarity of mind make your eyes smile. And may your prayer of listening deepen enough to hear in the distance the laughter of God. An aspiration means a wish path, a wish that guides us on a path. And our fellowship has chosen an aspiration we remind ourselves of each week. You may find the words in the order of service or on your screen at home. So please join me in renewing our aspiration as a fellowship. May love be the spirit of this fellowship. May the quest for the truth be its sacrament and service be its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our rest. The story this morning is a very down home story. I mean, I mean down home as in right here. Um, folks who've been here, attending here long enough might remember in the foyer, there was a plant in a vase with lovely green leaves and then COVID came and not so many people came, the staff came, but um, it was hard to keep track of everything. And then a few months ago, Cheryl Rao and I came over doing a, an aesthetic reconnaissance. And there was this vase with this plant. There was no water. It was all dried out. The stem looked really, really pallid. And, you know, it, it, it didn't look like a sure thing at all. But I took it home and added water first thing, of course. First thing it wanted was water. 
it didn't want much else to start with, but you can see that it's, it's making it, it's surviving. And in fact, it intended to survive. It still has some spots that you can tell still need healing. It was a very harsh experience for the plant. That happens to us too, all of us at times. We'll have some experience that we feel like wounded us, really actually caused us harm. And yet we can heal. And you can see this plant by the fact that it is healing, it intends to heal. And that's an important thing to think about, about plants. Because people don't think about plants automatically as, as having intention. But really, what I think and what I see demonstrated a lot is everything has intention. And the intention is to live, to flourish, and to offer beauty to others. So I brought this plant this morning to tell this story. I think the next step is I think it's now ready for an actual pot. And I think it could come to live again in the foyer under Kinara's picture to help us remember Kinara. So that's my story. Thank you. Like that? Is that good? Thank you. We intend that every person who joins us for service feels recognized and held among us. One way we create this is by honoring any joys or concerns we carry in our hearts and, and sharing them. If you wish to share, you may come forward and take a pebble or several from the bowl there on the windowsill. Then you could step to the microphone here, lower your mask, tell us your name, and briefly share your personal joy or concern. Then drop your pebble or pebbles into the water in the large bowl here. The ripples demonstrate how our caring and prayers move out from us into the world to touch others. Um, please honor that this is not a time for announcements, but a time for sharing from your heart and to be held lovingly among us. You may also choose to drop one or more pebbles without speaking, just taking a few moments with your thoughts or prayers. So once again, take one or more pebbles there, share orally if you wish, then drop your pebble or pebbles. After we've had the in-person sharing here, Scarlett will read those shared on Zoom. I'll stand on my tippy toes. I have the honor of having my feet raised by Marion Pennycab's little stool. So if you look back at the bench back there by my colorful 
blanket. You'll see the little stool. Here, it's right here. Oh, <laughs> I, well, I want you to stand on it. <laughs> and I'm putting up twenty dollars of the thirty dollars that I said I would pay for it. <laughs> oh, okay. Because it's staying in here for anybody that has it, especially my wife. <laughs> <laughs> And do you mind saying your name again? I've said it so many times, but I don't what yes. Kahema, Rakhema? Rakhema. Oh, I love that. So that was my announcement. The other one is that I happen to have the marble. And if you remember, if you've been here before. The marble was very important in uh, presenting. And so I have the marble today. And it will go back in there again for you to have it too. Thank you. Is anyone else short and would like to have? <laughs> Good morning. I, I'm Chip. Um, it was a pebble of appreciation for uh, Laura Bussey and uh, Sina Marino and Beverly Morgan Lewis, who stood yesterday for an hour and a half in wind and rain with barely adequate uh, rain gear, uh, displaying the banners for Black Lives Matter and the climate action. Uh, banner from the fellowship. <clears throat> um, this is a pebble in, in recognition of the influence of Marianne Pennekamp. Um, our, our granddaughter came over and had a meal with us and together we watched the documentary. Um, thanks to David Marshak, there are one or two copies can be found in the library. I don't know how the library is operating these days, but it'll be the honor system. Um, and this last stone, just this morning, I learned of the death of Bill Jeffries in, in North Carolina. When I first met Bill, I was barely, I, I was less than 20 years old, I think. And, uh, uh, fresh and sassy and untutored in, in, uh, in political engagement. And Bill was like the adult in the, uh, in, in the anti-Vietnam War, pro-peace, pro-civil rights movement. He was the Peace Education Secretary for American Friends Service Committee. And when I was 25, uh, 24, 25, I worked um, in the office with him and he was my mentor. And I was surprised to read this morning, he was only 15 years older than I am. Whereas when I was uh, still a sassy teenager, he seemed so much older. So. Good morning. Um, I'm Elizabeth, and I have three stones here. The first one is just a, a stone of gratitude for making it to the end of the semester. All of you associated with school and the university, hopefully I appreciate that. Um, the second one is for a successful trip back home to North Carolina to um, help my aunt and my mother as they put my grandmother into a, an extended care facility. She's 99, and she is living away from her home that she's been in for you know, the last 65 years. So this is a big, a big change for everybody. But I'm going back in January and we had a wonderful celebration of life um, via Zoom yesterday for my uncle Claire. So that was great to see everybody. Um, and he'll be buried at Arlington sometime next year. Um, and then this third stone is for Carlin for the passing of her father just recently. So our hearts go out to her as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
I'm Steve Davis. I'm the firstborn son of Ralph and Joanne Davis and the brother of Ruth Davis. And I'm so glad that we can come together finding joy in the midst of suffering because my dad fell backwards on the 1091 and is in St. Joseph Hospital getting good recovery from a hip fracture. So thank you so much, all of you who can cheer on our, our good mobility and our good sensibility and wisdom, especially in, in fall prevention. So thank you again for your long-term friendship and for celebrating joy this holiday season. Uh, good morning, my name is Dave, and I get here every oh, two to 10 years, whether I need to or not. And uh, today I am here to honor Mary Ann. So thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Bellamy. A lot of you probably don't know me, I've only been here once, but um, moving up here was a big change for me and my family. So it was nice to find somewhere else that also has a Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, especially as nice as this one. So thank you all for being so welcoming and supportive. So I chose a multifaceted and very interesting stone in honor and pride of for my son, Elizabeth's son, Harrison, who's going to be four in February, unbelievably, and who had his first overnight at away from us, either of us, at his sister's house last night. So way to go, Harrison. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Anthony. I'm surprised I'm going to do this. I'm, I think I was here once before to exhort people to uh, sign up for an uh, organ transplant. Um, a young man died very tragically um, at age 23. That was about five and a half years ago. And his heart beats in my body. On the, driving over here, I was thinking of the uh, prayer of St. Francis. We're talking about families. My grandfather was born in Germany in 1850. And my father was um, the 12th child, born in um, 1894. Um, many of he and his brothers, even being um, third order Franciscans, were called actually forced into uh, the First World War. And he came to the United States in 1925 and met my mother, whose parents, renowned Dr. Burkhard, was also Third Order Franciscans. And the prayer goes, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And it ends with the in dying, we're born to eternal life. And my quest is finding out what that dying is. Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj says this job is utterly continuous at every moment. And I can't think. And so this, this death is highly preferable to the bodies. And, uh, and God grant me the grace 
to find this dash. I thank you all for being here and making me feel welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe. Um, I joined the choir. I heard I met Elizabeth uh, a couple of years ago through our children, and I was so happy to hear there's a Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. But it, it was all nothing was in person because of COVID. So I was so happy to be able to join the choir about a year ago, and I'm so happy to be here in person now at the service with my partner Brian and our daughter Isla. So thank you for this community. I got you. <laughs> My name is Scarlett Tripsmith, and I'm the technical coordinator here at Huff. And we are very just so stoked to have you all here in person and on Zoom. And I will be reading the joys and sorrows from Zoom today. From Colleen Broderick. With deep love and sadness of my loss of my beloved son-in-law, Alberto, who passed two weeks ago, please send love and compassion. From Cindy Kopp, pebbles of gratitude for my Soul Matters family, John and Kim and Paul and Rick and Allison and Bob. From Allison O'Dowd, it is with a heavy heart that I grieve the death of my good friend's husband, Josh Gartner, who passed recently. Hope she can find peace one day as she embarks on raising her two young sons on her own. And uh, from Aubrey, hello, my name is Aubrey. This is my first time at Huff. Welcome, Aubrey, welcome. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, her sister, Ashley, is in the hospital in North Carolina. So she asks to please send healing, light, compassion, and prayers for her healing. Thank you. This is such a beautiful practice and a way to remember our interconnectedness. Thank you, Aubrey. Um, and just amidst this whole uh, suffering and finding joy, Huff was really what got me out of my suffering. And it's really... It's the little things. It's those tiny little moments when you can feel the sparkle, when you can feel a little light burning bright inside of you because your light has been flickered out. And so when, just follow your light and it's also okay to be in the darkness, but just remember that there's a flame really close by. And uh, for all the joys and sorrows that we keep close to our hearts today, May they rest in peace and may we all be peaceful. Thank you. As we all are feeling this morning from listening to each other and from what's in our own lives and our own hearts, there is so much that is heavy and hard upon us. So we turn this morning to two spiritual leaders of world renown, two clerics, one Tibetan Buddhist, the other African Episcopal Christian, both who became polit political leaders as well, not of their own choosing. And it was because of that combination that they each in their own time became um, Nobel laureates acknowledged by the world. But they, they became political leaders at a time when their people and their cultures and their races and their nations were being brutalized and oppressed. And so these two human beings found a way to sustain themselves and their people while fighting their oppressors without losing their core values uh, or their lives or their joy. So for us today, we felt that there were no better people to hear from and to hear tell how they did it and what they recommend 
as we ourselves struggle to find our way to save our planet, to heal the wounds of colonialism and racism in our own country, and help our families and friends in the time of this ongoing pandemic. Much of what you will hear is a reframing of our usual way at looking at suffering. So it may take some time to let it in and say, well, how does that apply to me? But Anne and I will be giving you a taste of a conversation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa. Who, and Desmond Tutu traveled to Dharamsala, India to celebrate His Holiness's 80th birthday in April of 2015 and to create what they um, wanted to, thought would um, be a gift for others. It was their reflections on how do they find joy in the face of life's inevitable suffering. So along with sharing their words, which Anne and I will do from, the, from a transcript excerpted from the book, The Book of Joy, which um, I recommend, uh, to get a more more fullness of what they had to say, as well as some very interesting commentary by the man who led the questions to them. But we hope that we will be able also, along with the words, to convey just a little of the loving and playful relationship that these two extraordinary beings have with each other, and that they enjoyed um, for a week during that time, and which they have enjoyed for many, many years as they have supported each other in their struggles. So I now will um, become the voice of the Archbishop as Anne becomes the voice of the Dalai Lama. Now we are in the 21st century. We are improving, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> We are improving on the innovations of the 20th century and continuing to improve our material world, but this culture is not sufficient to tackle our human problems. The real problem is here. Hmm. Hmm. I feel there's a big contradiction. There are several, seven billion human beings and nobody wants to have problems or suffering, but there are many problems and much suffering, most of our own creation. Why? Something is lacking. We need ultimately to have a greater concern for others' well being. In other words, kindness or compassion, which is lacking now. We must pay more attention to our inner values. Everyone seeks happiness, joyfulness, but from outside, from money, from power, from big car, from big house. Most people never pay much attention to the ultimate source of a happy life, which is inside, not outside. Even the source of physical health is inside, not outside. So there may be a few differences between us. You usually emphasize faith. Personally, I am Buddhist, and I consider faith very important. But at the same time, the reality is that out of 7 billion people, over 1 billion people on the planet are non-believers. We cannot exclude them. They also have the right to become happier human beings. So one must not depend on religious faith to educate our inner values. Well, it's very difficult to follow your very profound pronouncements. I thought you were going to say that, in fact, when you were pursuing happiness, you're not going to find it. It's very, very elusive. 
You don't find it by saying, I am going to forget about everything and just pursue happiness. You know, there's a title of a book C.S. Lewis wrote called Surprised by Joy, which I think expresses how it works. Many people look at you and they think of all the awful things that have happened to you, being exiled from your home, from the things that are really precious to you. And yet when people come to you, they experience someone who has a wonderful serenity, a wonderful compassion, a mischievousness. That's, that's the right word. I don't like too much formality. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> it's wonderful to discover that what we want is not actually happiness. It is not actually what I would speak of. I would speak of joy. Joy is the far greater thing. Think of a mother who is going to give birth. Almost all of us want to escape pain. And mothers know that they're going to have pain, the great pain of giving birth, but they accept it. And even after the most painful labor, once the baby is out, you can't measure the mother's joy. It is one of those incredible things that joy can come so quickly from suffering. Yes, it is true. Joy is something different from happiness. When I use the word happiness, in a sense, I mean satisfaction. Sometimes we have a painful experience, but that experience, as you said with birth, can bring great satisfaction and joyfulness. There are different aspects to any event. We lost our own country and became refugees. That same experience gave us new opportunities to see more things. For me personally, I had more opportunities to meet with different people, different spiritual practitioners like you, and also scientists. These new opportunities arrived because I became a refugee. There's a Tibetan saying, wherever you have friends, that's your country. And wherever you receive love, that's your home. Therefore, if you look from one angle, you feel, oh, how bad, how sad. But if you look from another angle at the same tragedy, the same event, you see that it gives me new opportunities. So it's wonderful. That's the main reason that I am not sad and morose. What you said is quite wonderful. I think I would just add to it by saying that to our sisters and brothers out there, anguish and sadness in many ways are things that you cannot control. They happen. It's part of the warp and woof of life. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. There are going to be frustrations in life. The question is not, how do I escape? It is, how can I use this as something positive? Speaking to you, when you smile, your face lights up. And it is because in a very large measure, you have transmuted what would have been totally negative. You've transmuted it into goodness. Because again, you have not said, well, how can I be happy? You said, how can I help to spread compassion and love? And people everywhere in the world come and they fill stadiums to see you. What they've come for is that you embody something which they feel, because it's not the words. It's the spirit behind those words. It is when you sit and you tell people that suffering, frustration are not the determinants of who we are. 
It is that we can use these things that are seemingly negative for a positive effect. We've received a question that someone has submitted saying, many people when they get ill don't feel very joyful. You've been able to maintain that joy in the face of suffering. How have you been able, how have you been able to do it? Well, I have certainly been helped by many other people. One of the good things is realizing that you are not a solitary cell. You are part of a wonderful community. That's greatly helped. And I think some suffering, maybe even intense suffering, is a necessary ingredient for life, certainly for developing compassion. At some point, you will be in anguish. It does not help to be too self-centered. It helps you to some extent to look away from yourself and it can help make that anguish bearable. A compassionate concern for others' well-being is the source of happiness. So as you rightly mentioned, a self-centered attitude is the source of the problem. You know, if we don't take care of ourselves, we cannot survive. We should have wise selfishness rather than foolish selfishness. In fact, taking care of others, helping others ultimately is the way to discover your own joy and to have a happy life. So that is what I call wise selfishness. Well, you are wise. Not just why selfish, you are wise. So we have a question then. Have you renounced pleasure? When we speak of experiencing happiness, we need to know that there are actually two different kinds. The first is the enjoyment of pleasure through our senses but we can also experience happiness at the deeper level through our mind, such as through love, compassion, and generosity. What characterizes happiness at this deeper level is the sense of fulfillment that you experience. While the joy of the senses is brief, the joy at this deeper level is much longer lasting it is true joy. A believer develops this deeper level of joy through faith in God, which brings inner strength, inner peace. For a non-believer or a non-theist like me, we must develop this deeper level of joy through training the mind. This kind of joy or happiness comes from within then the pleasure of the senses becomes less important. If you develop a strong sense of concern for the well being of all sentient beings, and in particular, all human beings, this will make you happy in the morning, even before coffee. <laughs> this is the value of having compassionate feelings for others. Even, you see, 10 minutes or 30 minutes of meditating on compassion and kindness for others, and you will see its effects all day. That's the way to maintain a calm and joyous mind. So our greatest joy comes from this. Hmm. We are wired to be caring for the other and generous to one another. We shrivel when we are not able to interact. I mean, that is part of the reason why solitary confinement is such a horrendous punishment. We depend on the other in order for us to be fully who we are. We have a concept at home, the concept of Ubuntu, 
It says, a person is a person through other persons. And you realize that in a very real sense, we're meant for a very profound complementarity. It is the nature of things. You don't have to be a believer in anything. We belong in this delicate network. It is actually quite profound. The reality, is, that, is it still on? Hello? Yeah, okay. Better, okay. Thank you. I can be louder. <laughs> the reality, as the Archbishop mentioned, is that one individual, no matter how powerful, how clever, cannot survive without other human beings. So the best way to fulfill your wishes, to reach your goals, is to help others to make more friends. How do we create more friends? Trust. How do you develop trust? It's simple. You show your genuine sense of concern for their well-being. Then trust will come. Without trust, there is no friendship. And we need friends, genuine friends. Like us. We are created in order to flourish, and we flourish in community. When we become self-centered, turning in on ourselves, as sure as anything, we're going to find one day a deep, deep, deep frustration. Well, now, let us talk about some obstacles to joy. People would like to be able to take a pill that makes their fear and anxiety go away and makes them immediately feel peaceful. This is impossible. One must develop the mind over time and cultivate mental immunity, but it takes time. Stress and anxiety often come from too much expectation and too much ambition. Then when we don't fulfill that expectation or achieve that ambition, we experience frustration. Right from the beginning, it's a self-centered attitude. I want this, I want that. Often we are not being realistic about our own ability or about objective reality. When we have a clear picture about our own capacity, we can be realistic about our effort. Then there is a much greater chance of achieving our goals. Unrealistic effort only brings disaster. So in many cases, our stress is caused by our expectations and ambition. Yes. You have answered very well. You always answer well, but you have done this quite well. <laughs> the only thing I the only thing I think is that sometimes people get quite annoyed with themselves unnecessarily, especially when they have thoughts and feelings that are really quite natural. Because I think we've got to accept ourselves as we are and then hope to grow in much the way the Dalai Lama described. I mean, getting to know what the things are that trigger us. These are things that you can train, you can change, but we ought not to be ashamed of ourselves. We are human, and sometimes it's a good thing that we recognize that we have human emotions. Now the thing is being able to say, when is it appropriate? And so I think we shouldn't think we are super women and super men. To hold down emotions is not wise. I would say, go ahead and even, even maybe shout out your sadness and pain. This can bring you back to normal. 
It is locking them up and pretending that they are not there that causes them to fester and become a wound. Now, I've not read this in a book. I just, it's just how I have handled them. We don't really either get close to others if our relationship is made up of unending hunky-doryness. It is hard times, the painful times, the sadness and the grief that knit us more closely together. Yes, sadness and grief are of course natural responses to loss. If your focus remains on who or what you've just lost, the experience is less likely to lead to despair. In contrast, if your focus while grieving remains mostly on yourself, what am I going to do now? How can I cope? Then there is greater danger of going down the path of despair and depression. The way through sadness and grief that comes from great loss is to use it as motivation to generate a deeper sense of purpose. When my beloved teacher passed away, I used to think that now I have more responsibility to fulfill his wishes. So my sadness translated into more enthusiasm, more determination. With the great sadness of loss, one can live an even more meaningful life. We will now have an intermission while the choir sings. We've received another question submitted. The world is in such turmoil, war, starvation, terrorism, pollution, genocide. How to find joy in the midst of such large world problems? You show your humanity by how you see yourself not as apart from others or from your connection to others. I have frequently wept about the things such as you have mentioned. Yes, we're capable of the most awful atrocities. We can give a catalog and God weeps until there are those who say, I do want to try to do something. It is good also to remember that we have a fantastic capacity for goodness. And then you look again and you see those doctors and nurses who go into those situations. 
And they are just showing us what we are all capable of being, people of compassion. What can you do to change that situation? You might not be able to do a great deal, but start where you are and do what you can where you are. And yes, be appalled. It would be awful if we looked at all the horrendousness and we said, ah, it doesn't really matter. It's so wonderful that we can be distressed. I do sometimes get very angry with God. Some of my, some of my friends, when they are really facing some trouble, sometimes they complain at the Buddha, similar idea. Yes, I usually would go to my chapel if I had something that really upset me, and I would lambast God. I weep when something has happened where I may not be able to assist. I acknowledge that it is something I can do very little about. But it's also good to recognize, speaking from our struggle against apartheid, how incredibly noble people are. You know, human beings are basically good. You know, that's where we have to start. That everything else is an aberration. Yes, when we look at the news, we must keep this more holistic view. Yes, this or that terrible thing has happened. But at the same time, there are many more positive things happening in our world. We must have a sense of proportion and a wider perspective. Then we will not feel despair when we see these sad things. I say to people that I am not an optimist because that in a sense is something that depends on feelings more than the actual reality. No, hope is different. And that is based not on the ephemerality of feelings, but on the firm ground of conviction. I believe with a steadfast faith that there can never be a situation that is utterly, totally hopeless. Hope is deeper and very, very close to unshakable. It's not in your head. It is here in the pit of your tummy. Despair comes from deep grief, but it can also be a defense against the risks of bitter disappointment and shattering heartbreak. Resignation and cynicism are easier, more self-soothing postures that do not require the raw vulnerability and tragic risk of hope. To choose hope is to step firmly forward into the howling wind, bearing one's chest to the elements and knowing that in time, the storm will pass. So how do we help people who really want to be joyful? who really want to see the world become a better place. Why are you joyful even when you see these problems and, and have faced these challenges? I mean, how do you get to get this calm in the midst of it all? Thank you. This, I think, merits discussion. There is a Tibetan saying that it is actually the painful experiences that shine a light on the nature of happiness. They do this by bringing joyful experiences into sharp relief. Many people think of suffering as a problem. Actually, it is an opportunity that destiny has given to us. In spite of difficulties and suffering, you can remain firm and maintain your composure. You see, in reality, such as our physical body, where growth takes time, our mental development also takes time, minute by minute, day by day. 
month by month, year by year, decade by decade. One has learned in very many instances that for us to grow in generosity of spirit, we have to undergo in some way or other diminishing, a frustration. There are very few lives that just move smoothly from beginning to end. They have to be refined. And it seems without fail that generosity of spirit requires that we will have experienced if not suffering, then at least frustrations, things that seem to want to stop us from moving in a particular direction that we have chosen. You don't move easily straightforwardly like this. There are things that force you off course and you have to come back. It is probably something like your muscles. I mean, if you want a good muscle tone, you work against it, offering it resistance and it will grow. There's a measure of going against, as it were, your nature. So what is true physically is in a wonderful way, true spiritually as well. Deep down, we grow in kindness when our kindness is tested. Yes, I agree, absolutely. This reminds me of my friend, Lopon La who told me about being sent to a Chinese gulag at the time I escaped from Tibet. He told me that during those 18 years of hard labor, he faced some real dangers. I thought, of course, he was talking about dangers to his life. What he told me was he was in danger of losing his compassion for his Chinese guards. The incredible thing is that when we think of alleviating other people's suffering, our own suffering is reduced. This is the true secret to happiness. So it's a very practical thing. Yes, I would hope people would try it out because it's very difficult just speaking about it theoretically. When you try it out, why does it work? We really are wired to be caring of the other. We were wired for this complementarity, this togetherness. It isn't sentimental, it's for real. I know that each time I have acted compassionately, I have experienced the joy in me that I find in nothing else. Yes, that is the basis of our hope. So how can a person find joy in their life while there are so many who are suffering? We are meant to live in joy. This does not mean that life will be easy or painless. It means that we can turn our faces to the wind and accept that this is the storm we must pass through. We cannot succeed by denying what exists. The acceptance of reality is the only place from which change can begin. As an old man, I can say, start where you are and realize that you are not meant on your own to resolve all of the massive problems. Do what you can, it seems so obvious. And you will be surprised actually at how it can get to be catching. There are very many, many people. I mean, my heart leaps with joy at discovering the number of people who care. You do not need to finish the work. It takes time, but we are learning, we are growing, we are becoming the people we want to be. It helps no one if you sacrifice your joy because others are suffering. We people who care must be attractive, must be filled with joy so that others recognize that caring, that helping and being generous are not a burden, they are a joy. 
Give the world your love, your service, your healing, but you can also give it your joy. This too is a gift. So our offering a portion of our worldly goods each Sunday is a part of our practicing generosity, demonstrating our gratitude and receiving the joy that comes from giving as part of a community. We try to make it effortless for you by offering different ways on the screen and home or by giving you a QR code on your order of service. But you can also uh, drop your offering in the basket at the door on your way out, or send a check at any time made out to Huff, H-U-U-F, uh, here at the fellowship. This morning offering will now be gratefully received as Annette Gurney Hall blesses us again with her music. For our benediction today, I will call again on John O'Donohue and, and the extinguishing of the chalice. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot <laughs> the order of business. Um, besides being, of course, thanking you for your gifts uh, today and the gift of who you are, I want to remind you before we close the service. If you plan to attend in person in the future, please remember to reserve a spot ahead of time, uh, or, or you may end up in the overflow section in the foyer. You can sign up by going to huff.org and clicking on the link at the top of the homepage. Or you can contact our congressional administrator, Bridget Garuti, and ask her to add your name to the list. And remember to keep uh, safe distance from each other on your way out. And now, finally, we will close the service with a benediction and the uh, extinguishing in the chalice. And now I will call again on John O'Donohue for a blessing. It actually is a blessing he wrote for his mother. On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of loss gets into you, may a flock of colors, indigo, red, green, and azure blue, 
come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the oceans be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to mind your life. Blessed it be. And now may we go from here in peace, go in love. You can find the words in your order of service as Annette plays us out. May you have a good and joyful week. Shalom, assalamu alaikum, blessed be, ase, aho, namaste, sarva mangalam, may all be auspicious. <laughs>